welcome to day 344 of Shape by the Word. I'm Paul Kemp here with Matt Kresge, Katie Kresge, and David Keefe. And we continue in the first uh, letter of John. Uh, John's letter takes up right where his gospel left off. Matter of fact, you almost see it as a practical application of the deep truths that he has shared throughout the gospel. As he applies it to a church who is trying to live out the gospel in a really difficult situation, not only under persecution, but uh, under false teaching uh, as well. And, of course, John encourages them to stay faithful to Christ, to know that they were created in Christ to live above sin and to uh, live for God. And, of course, he encourages them to be very careful in in how they weigh the teaching that is coming their way. So before we uh, complete this letter today, chapters 4 and 5, let's offer this moment to the Lord. Uh, Matt, you mind lifting us up in prayer? Father, we thank you for this time together. Uh, We ask that as as we... um, Spend time in your word and, and reflect on, on who you are and, and what you've done in Christ Jesus. Uh, your very heart that, that, Father, you would be with us. Uh, you would use your word to accomplish your purposes in us. And, um, and, and Father, you'd be glorified through it. Uh, we thank you for uh, First John. We thank you for the truths that we've already um, unpacked in, in this podcast together and, and the ones that we look forward to um, entering into today. Uh, Father, we are grateful for this time uh, use it for your glory and, and our joy it's in christ name we pray amen mm-hmm. first john chapter 4 verse 1 dear friends do not believe every spirit but test the spirits to see whether they are from god because many false prophets have gone out into the world this is how you can recognize the spirit of god every spirit that acknowledge that jesus christ has come in the flesh is from god but every spirit that does not acknowledge jesus christ is not from god this is the spirit of the antichrist which you've heard is coming and even now is already in the world You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them, because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. They are from the world, and therefore speak from the viewpoint of the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God, and whoever knows God listens to us, but whoever is not from God does not listen to us. This is how we recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. Dear friend, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. This is how we know we live in him and he in us. He has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the father has sent his son to be the savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them, and they in God. And so we know and rely on the love that God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God, and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us, so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear, because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God yet hates his brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command, anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. This is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out his commands. In fact, this is love for God to keep his commands, and his commands are not burdensome, for everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. He did not come by water only, but by water and blood, and it is the Spirit who testifies, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and the three are in agreement. We accept human testimony, but God's testimony is greater because of the testimony of God, which is given about his Son. Whoever believes in the Son of God accepts his testimony. Whoever does not believe uh, God has made him out to be a liar because they have not believed the testimony God has given about his Son. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and that life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. This is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. 
And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we have asked of him. If you see any brother or sister commit a sin that does not lead to death, you should pray, and God will give them life. I refer to those whose sin does not lead to death. There is a sin that leads to death. I'm not saying that you should pray about that. All wrongdoing is sin, and there is a sin that does not lead to death. We know that anyone born of God does not continue to sin. The one who is born of God keeps them safe, and the evil one cannot harm them. We know that we are children of God, and the whole world is under the control of the evil one. We know also the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true by being in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. Dear children, keep yourselves from idols. I love the ending. Mm -hmm. Uh, Very simply, uh, he's already told us, you know, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in them for everything in the world. Uh, the lust of the flesh, the things that we desire, the lust of the eyes, the things that we'd love to have. And the boastful pride of life doesn't come from God, but from the Father. And here in the end, he just very simply says, uh, keep yourself from idols, all of which those things are. Mm-hmm. You know, the desire to please ourselves, the desire to have more of the things of the world, and the desire to have our identity, uh, you know, confirmed in the world or approved of, you know, by, by the world. You get a kind of guess that he had. He probably takes loving brothers and sisters pretty seriously. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, he continues to repeat that, and the rhythm that you hear that uh, is uh, really strong. Mm-hmm. It's interesting how. Um, well, I think on that topic, it's good for us to talk through just like what what kind of love is he talking about? Because it's so easy to take this passage and and put our own definition of love on it. Um, and just kind of make it whatever we want it to be. But, you know, if we take like a, a biblical definition of love, that is, n- that is not an easy kind of love to offer our brothers and sisters. Um, if we're in disagreement with them, um, if they view us as their enemies, if we view them the same way, um, then we are called to love them with a faithful type of love. And it's also the kind of love that leads us to um, – call out sin maybe at times with our brothers and sisters and um in a loving and gentle way so i just i think like it this passage is so easy to take out of context and and put our own context into it um well i don't know what are y'all's thoughts on that (laughs) well you know he's he's already through the letter given a lot of definition to love Mm -hmm. Uh, he's already told us uh, you know that this is how you know christ loved us he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. And in the very next phrase, he gives the example of, you see, a brother and sister in need and just say, be warm and filled. You know, what good is that? Uh, you know, we should love, you know, in action and truth, not simply in word and deed. So a big part of love is sacrificially meeting, you know, meeting, you know, meeting the needs of others. But he's also, you know, give us a little bit of definition in our love for God. We know that we've come to love God if we obey his commands. And, and so the love that we have for God takes the shape of the mandates of Scripture. Uh, you know, we don't just simply love Him by uh, and having warm, you know, feelings about who He is. We love Him by responding to His character and responding to His Word. And of course, we love those around us by responding the way that He has called us to respond. And uh, that's not just a, a warm, you know, kind of fuzzy mm-hmm. feeling that we have toward each other. It is, you know, loving. Uh, to challenge people according to God's word. It is loving, uh, you know, to uh, encourage people to walk in God's word. And those are not easy conversations sometimes, you know, to have. Mm-hmm. So love can, you know, love can take, be difficult, but biblical love takes the shape of of scripture. Mm-hmm. And, and he speaks of love in context of, of the gospel, right? And I love in verse 10, he says, you know, you know, this is love, not that we've loved God, but that God has loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice, you know, for our sins, which is right at the core of the gospel and right at the heart of just the uniqueness of Christianity, not that we do these things to, to get God's love or we perform in such a way, or if I love other people, I'll finally get God's love. But even when we didn't love him, he loved us so much and he points us to Christ as the picture of that, mm-hmm. which that is a, obviously not just the foundation, but also the motivation, you know, for how we love others in, in light of how Christ yeah. has loved us. And, and, and of course he says we love uh, not because we've generated this love in our own heart and our own strength but because he first loved us mm-hmm. 
and reminds you of Paul's phrase, you know, in Romans chapter 5, that the love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts through the Holy Spirit, which he has given us. And so this is also a spirit-led, you know, kind of love, or a supernatural love would be another way to put it. This is not naturally how we love one another, and this is not naturally how we love God. Mm-hmm. And, of course, he's building on that, you know, the whole idea that, you know, from John 14, whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love him, and we will show ourselves to him. Mm-hmm. And here he says we love God, you know, by obeying his commands. Mm-hmm. And so it is a, mm. a much deeper, much more substantive, much more deeply, you know, committed kind of love than what we're talking about. And it is a love that, you know, shouldn't be absent of feeling, but it is a love that is in spite of, you know, in spite of our, in spite of our feeling. Mm-hmm. So usually biblically speaking, especially in the Gospel of John, you have both the word agape, which is a deep commitment to another person uh, for their well-being, and phileo, which is brotherly affection. And so the two of those should come together mm. in the way that we love each other. Sometimes one or the other is absent <laughs> in how we love. Sometimes both are absent you know, in, in how we love. Yeah, no, and, and for me, and you even talked about this at the start, you know, I, Paul has, or John has such good theology, and, and now he's also, that theology doesn't just stay theology, but it, it plays out practically in his life and in within the church community. Mm-hmm. And so I always need that reminder as we kind of do these and read and study and it's not just about knowing these things, but it has an effect in our life. And I just love how he says that in in verse 19 and 20, you know, we love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God yet hates his brother or sister is a liar. And so this whole theology of love is, is playing out practically, which is something I always need to be reminded of. And he would connect it back to, you know, the big issue is not uh, that we haven't loved our brother or sister, but we haven't loved God appropriately mm-hmm. if we're not loving our mm-hmm. brother or sister. Right. Yeah, if, if we loved God appropriately, we would obey his command to love one another. Yeah, and and right. I, I love that connection. You know, we've been talking about love and, and then obeying the commands of God as you know, evidence of, of that love. But then he goes on to say, and his commands are not burdensome. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and just how many times I think of the commands you know, from God to me a, as being burdensome commands or or weights that are like right. th- these seem unnecessary or and 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 i know it's like probably not at times like christian to, to say it in that way we kind of look at it like well i know everything in scripture is good for me but we will read a passage and I'm like ah this is burdens. so hard yeah. <laughs> yeah. no thanks yeah. <laughs> no and, and it's you know and, and we experience you know some of that in our natural relationships uh, when we do something for someone we love because we love them it, it lightens the task mm-hmm. altogether, and how much more should that be true, you know, of God when we're doing this? Uh, and, and of course, that, that's one framework we can put it in when you're loving a brother or sister. That's a little bit hard to love. I'm not doing this for them, and I'm not doing this for me. I'm doing this because He loved me, and I yeah. love Him, and this pleases Him. Isn't it so hard to do it like that, though? <laughs> I even want to love people and do things, and like, but they didn't say thank you. Like, you know, what, what the heck? You know, I, you must have missed everything I said <laughs> yeah. because that has nothing to do, you know, with what I just said. Uh, but uh, it, anyway, also it's kind of interesting. I mean, we, we do have to do a little theology here. You know, moving past, uh, uh, you know, the ability, you know, to uh, love one another. It's interesting that he said the way we test the spirits is anyone who says that Christ has come in the flesh, you know, is from God. He's dealing with a different, uh, you know, set of problems than we are today. Uh, This is early Gnostic teaching uh, where they said, you know, (laughs) Christ didn't really uh, inhabit a fleshly body. He just seemed to, you know, be one, you know, be one of us. Uh, today, you know, it's probably just the opposite. Most people will affirm the humanity of Christ, but not the the deity uh, of Christ. So we would say, you know, anyone who you know, denies uh, the deity of Christ, that Christ came as, you know, as God, as, as the incarnation of, of the Holy God, uh, would be, you know, would be the Antichrist. But both of those are the heart of uh, the affirmation of who Jesus is. He is everything that we are and everything God is all, all at once uh, human in every way and divine in every way. Mm-hmm. Can we please spend a little bit of time, what we have left, talking about five, chapter 5, verses 6, and that paragraph, just the theology of the spirit and the, wa- and the water and the blood, like what that poss- might possibly mean to those of us who don't necessarily understand the imagery there but i mean i would think that it's in reference to um when jesus in john talks in john 3 talks about um the spirit and water right you have to be born of spirit and water 
but then there's blood thrown in here which would what represents represent the atonement of jesus go why don't you take that <laughs> well thank you very much Katie, for passing that off with 14 seconds left yeah. in, in, in the podcast the images are you know the images are you know very rich images and, and of course you do have the image of you know jesus being crucified and uh, uh you know the water and blood that you know flowed from his side but you also have the old testament image of whenever uh, israel entered into uh, you know a covenant uh, with god at mount sinai the the blood and water were mixed together and sprinkled over the people and so there is a picture of atonement and there's also a picture of covenant which is the picture that he gave us you know at the at the last uh you know at, at the passover uh you know this is a blood you know this is blood in the new covenant so some people see this as physical you know talking about christ's physicality you know the water and blood i see it you know as talking about the atonement uh in in the covenant uh so that uh, the cleansing, the atonement, and uh, the fact that he has given us a spirit are three things that testify to who Christ is mm. and what he has done. Matt? <laughs> Sounds good to me. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Ditto. Great job. There we go. That was good. <laughs> uh, fun. You did that very quickly. Heavenly, yeah. Yes. <laughs> Next time, let's do that a little bit earlier. <laughs> Heavenly Father, thank you for the water and the blood and the spirit. Uh, whether the blood symbolizes the physicality of Christ uh, or the atoning work of Christ by which he has cleansed us and purified us and, and sent his spirit in us to redeem us, to make us whole, restore us, and walk beside us. We thank you for the gift that you've given us, and we recognize that uh, we, we don't naturally love this way, and we don't love because we decided to love you, but because you first loved your, us and you gave yourself as atoning sacrifice for our sin. You're a good and a holy God, and may we, Father, love you well today by loving those around us. Mm-hmm. And, and we understand that doesn't mean those who are easy to love, but those who are hard to love. For your name, for your glory, and for our joy. Mm-hmm. Amen. Amen.